Wonderful privilege for me to be uh, standing here this morning, uh, ministering God's word. Um, the very first Christian mentor that I ever had in my life uh, was my uncle, Uncle Vic de Vries, who came to faith in this church many, many years ago. And um, I remember being expelled from Gray College in Bloemfontein. Who weet jou over zijn Gray? I say for you. My seni altijd is gescore said Gray eight. Well I remember being expelled from Gray College and no other school would take me in Bloemfontein. But my Uncle Vic took me in. And it was my Uncle Vic that came to faith in this church right here. So it's special for me to stand here and minister God's word. My wife was told by the doctors that she'd never be able to have children. The endometriosis was so bad that she would not be able to conceive but God but God and it was with the birth of our first daughter our third child uh, Jubilee that name the Lord confirmed that name at an Esther conference in this church and the missional call on my life came in your Lapa when a man by the name of Mike Bernard came and spoke on the persecuted church. So when I stand here this morning, it really is a very big honor and a privilege to stand behind this pulpit and to minister from the word of God. You are in a season of being like Jesus. And I'm going to read two scriptures for you and then we'll pray. The first scripture, and you, you can sit there, it's short, I'll just read it for you, is John 20, 21. Where Jesus says, as the Father has sent me, so too I send you. As the Father has sent me, so too I send you. And then I'm going to shoot to Romans where Paul is speaking. And then he says the following words from Romans 10, from verse 13. He says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Father, I just want to commit this morning to you and, oh God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will, will move in our lives. I pray that your word will weigh heavy on our hearts. And I pray that the truth from your word will lead us into action. Oh God, I pray that you will take away all complacency from our lives. Father, that we may be radical Christians who represent your kingdom as ambassadors, fearlessly proclaiming the good news that you have given us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So this morning I'm speaking to those who 
are new in the faith, who have been in the faith for quite some time, and, and I believe the Lord might be challenging you to step it up a notch to go into another gear. And also I'm speaking this morning to those of you who are walking this path with the Lord faithfully, have been walking it for many years, and to you I want to say, well done, don't stop now. Don't stop now. After Paul's conversion, what we see is radical conviction, radical obedience, and radical proclamation. You see, feelings and just fluffy emotions, they don't endure whipping. They don't endure stoning. They don't endure prison. They don't endure shipwrecks. And they don't endure martyrdom. Radical conviction and radical obedience is what endures that. And my question to you this morning is how strong are your convictions as a Christian? And how radical is your obedience? Whether you're an an introvert, an extrovert, a preacher or not, conversion has to lead to a radical conviction. I know as I know as I know that I believe what is written in this book. And I will live accordingly. And I will do what it tells me to do. That's conviction. It will then lead to radical love for God and radical love for people. And radical obedience of the proclamation of the gospel. Ons is nie sonda christene nie. The power of the church is what happens from the moment we leave here today until the next Sunday we come back. That's what the church is. This is the gathering of believers where we come together and we praise God and we testify of His goodness. And we we share testimonies of what He's busy doing. But the power of a church, the success of a church is what it looks like out there during the week. Are we all to be missionaries? I wish I could say yes, but the answer is no. (laughs) We're we're not all called to be missionaries. We're not all called to sell the house, sell the cars, pack it all up and go to a foreign country. But I will tell you this, that God is on a mission to redeem unto himself a fallen people. And every single person who professes to be a Christian is called to be part of God's mission mission so he's the one that's on the mission and you need to figure out what is my purpose within his mission that he is busy with his mission that he sent his son to die for man what is your part to play in that mission i'll help you a little bit first peter 2 verse 9 it says that We are to proclaim the excellencies of the one that pulled us from darkness into light. Do you know what that means? It means that at the very least, through your life, through your word, through your deed, through your proclamation, you are to proclaim the excellencies of God who saved you from where you used to be. And that's what I'm doing this morning. At the very least, I'm testifying that I used to be a rubbish. But Jesus saved me. Jesus forgave me. I am washed by the blood of Christ. At the very least, every one of us sitting here this morning ought to be doing that. Proclaiming the excellencies. Of God who plucked us from that dark place and pulled us into that marvelous and glorious light. But then if you read Romans 15, Paul is busy speaking and he's telling the church in Rome, I'm going to come visit you. But first I need to go to Jerusalem. He says, and, and, and what I need from you to understand is that the church, the Gentile church, has given me material assistance to take to them. And then he appeals to the Roman church, 
pray for me as I go. So he says there, he says, the Gentiles who have come to faith have given me materialistic, in other words, money or whatever the case may be, possession so that I can help the poor Christians in Jerusalem. And while I'm going, I need you to pray for me, please. So at the very least, we are to be proclaiming the excellencies of the one who pulled us from darkness into light. We should be giving to the causes of the gospel and we should be interceding. As Christian, that's the very least that you should be doing. But when we get to, to this Romans 10 part, Paul makes a statement. And then he follows that statement with four rhetorical questions. A rhetorical question is actually a question that does not need to be answered. It's like a, a duh moment. So, so, so the statement is, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. And then Paul goes with these rhetorical questions, and he says, how? Say it for me. Say it for me. How are they going to call if they don't believe. How are they going to believe if they don't hear? How are they going to hear if no one is preaching? How are they going to preach if no one is actually sending them? How are they going to preach if they're not being sent? Yeah, let, me, let me just take that few backwards. There needs to be sending from this church. People need to leave from here and need to go so that they can be preaching, so that they can be hearing, so that they can be believing, so that they can be the calling upon the name of the Lord, so that they can be saving. That's how it works. And that's what Paul did. That's what he knew. That's what he lived by. The, the theme in my life for the past couple of years has been trying to mobilize people from a place of being stationary Christians to actively engaged Christians in their communities and in the mission field and in the proclamation of the gospel. And it all started when a man asked me to preach a sermon called, Why Not Me, Why Not Now? That's where it started. But you'll never ever have a, have a breakthrough in that regard if you don't understand three things. If you don't understand the gospel clearly, you're not going to be effective. Understanding the gospel alone should make you such an effective Christian, it should be scary. But also, if you understand the mandate that Christ has given you. And also, if you understand the history of how we all got here this morning. So let's have a look at the gospel and start with that. Luke 2 verse 10 says, And the angels said to them, the shepherds, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. The good news is only good news when it actually reaches the person on time. And the good news is only truly good news when you understand the bad news. Have you ever thought of that? A lot of people walk up, hey, do you know the good news? Well, what's the bad news? What, what, what's the bad news? If you walk into a jewelry store, the guy doesn't take out a, a nugget of gold and put it down on a, on a yellow piece of paper. He, he'll take out a diamond, and he doesn't put it on a white piece of paper. No, he takes out that diamond, and he puts it out on a black cloth. Because on that black cloth, it pops. It stands out. 
So to truly understand the gospel, to truly understand the good news, and to embrace it, folks, we, we have to know what the bad news is. So, so let me take you there. The bad news is that without Christ, one is separated from God. At war with God. And dead in their sins. That's bad news. That's bad news. Ephesians 2 verse 12. It says that at that time you were without Christ. Being aliens of the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without God in the world. Wow. Isn't that a dismal verse? The words that pop out there for me, without Christ, alienated, strangers, no hope, without God. That's what separation from God looks like. That's what depravity looks like. Or what about at war with God? Andre, seriously? At war with God? Well, Romans 8 verse 7 says, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. And that word enmity means hostile and hatred towards God. So you go fleas hot hot. The flesh hates God. And then dead in our sins. Romans 6.23 says that the wage of sin is death. The luen for the sonde is the doet. That is bleak. That is dismal. That is bad news. And by the way, when we, when we do our evangelism, that should actually be mentioned. Just by the way. Jesus loves you. Thank you very much. So does my mother. It's true. Save from what? You need to be saved. Save from what? Save from what? You need to be saved from the wrath of God. You need to know that there's a heaven, that there's a hell, and that when you die, it is one of those two destinations. And every second, two people die. And it's heaven or hell. And that's the reality. But what happened on the cross? You see, in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying. And he says, Father, he says, please remove this bitter cup from me. He says, let this bitter cup pass me by, that I don't need to drink from it. The question you need to ask yourself is, what was in the cup that Jesus didn't want to drink? It was the wrath of his father. It wasn't just the nails. It wasn't just the cross. It wasn't just the crucifixion. It was the fact that for every immoral thing that I did in my life, he was going to be punished for it. And not only me, but you. And you, and you, and you, and every person sitting, and every person that calls upon the name of the Lord is going to be saved. Their hell was put onto him by his father. That's what happened on the cross. Your sin was imputed to him. And the punishment that you were to receive, he took. The forever and ever and ever of hell that I should have gotten, he took on himself. And the righteous life that he lived was imputed unto me. Undeservingly. That's what happened on the cross. And then, 
we're no longer separated from God, but reconciled. See, now we start getting to the good news. 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, And all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself. How? Through Jesus Christ. And listen to this, just by the way. And has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Wow. Wow. So when you are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, you are given the ministry of reconciliation. Who can you still blame with your salahheit? Please tell me that. And, and I'm challenging you this morning, man. How, I, I don't get it when people say to me, geloof is a, is a private thing. It's not a private thing. It's about life or death. People die without Christ because we who have the good news don't open up our mouths and are afraid to testify. We're no longer at war. We're at peace. Romans 5 verse 1 says, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're no longer dead but alive. Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5 says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. How? Through Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's the good news. What was separated, what was an enemy of God, what was dead was shown mercy, was embraced, was granted peace, and was given eternal life. God took what was dead and made it alive. Now you tell me, when you understand that, when you clearly understand the gospel, how can you remain silent? God forbid. God forbid. But not only the gospel. What about the mandate? What van die opdrag wat eindelijk vir ons gegee is? You see, ultimately, it's not about missions. I want you to picture the biggest stadium that you've ever been in. What's the biggest stadium you've been in? Loftus, I was at Loftus for Jesus. I think it was about 70,000 people. That's quite big. Picture the biggest stadium you've ever been in. I was very fortunate to be in the United States at a football game. It's like this huge derby in a place called the Iron Bowl. 102,000 people in that stadium. I've never witnessed something like that in my life before. Now, I want you to take the biggest stadium that you can imagine. That's mine. And let us just times it, multiply it by five. And imagine how big it is now. Multiply that stadium by ten. And imagine how big it is now. And I want you to picture the throne room of God. And I want you to think how big that is. You see, ultimately, it's not missions. Ultimately, it's worship. We are gathering people and populating heaven so that God can be adored, so that God can be worshipped, because He deserves every drop of our worship. It's not missions. Missions will end. Evangelism will end. But worship will not cease. Let me prove it to you. Revelation 7 verse 9. After this I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. How big must the stadium be? How big must the throne room of God be? That there are so many people that John couldn't even number it in the vision. From every nation. Every tribe, 
every people, every language, standing before the, the, the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and they have palm branches in their hands. And what are they all doing? They're worshiping God. Ultimately, we are populating heaven for God to be worshipped because he deserves every drop of it. But then Jesus, nobody mandates us. Nobody gives us the commission like Jesus himself. You know, when I travel on mission, before I leave, I say the most important things to my wife. I'll say to Andriette, I love you. I say, if anything happens to me, there's a file in my office, <laughs> read the instructions. It's like step one, step two, step three. Balio soir. It's like, this is the stuff I do. It's like, I say the most important things. I embrace my children. I tell them I love them. I tell them, whatever you do, follow Jesus. I say the most important things before I leave. And before Jesus' ascension, he says this. He says in Matthew 28, 19. Go and make disciples of all nations. Now that word nations is ethne in the Greek. It's ethnic people group. Go and make disciples of every tribe, every ethnic people group. Or in Mark, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Or in Luke, Jesus says that repentance and the forgiveness of sins shall be preached in his name to all nations, that's tribes. Or John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so too I'm sending you. Or what about Acts? Acts 1 verse 8. But you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses. And by the way, that word witness is translated as martyr. You're going to be my martyrs. You will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem. And the Afrikaans said it more. In Beida. You want to know why your pastor is far from here right now? Because of that word Beida. In both Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. That's Jesus giving the mandate. And then we jump back to Revelation, which I just read you now. And you see that the mandate is going to be fulfilled. Heaven is going to be populated from people from every tribe, every nation, every tongue. They're all going to be worshiping God. And are you telling me that you want to sit on the sideline while that's happening? I don't want to. I don't want to. I think people would die to work for Apple or Google or Amazon. And we have the CEO of all CEOs offering us the greatest privilege to be a part of the, the greatest movement of the planet. And so many people don't realize it. We have such an opportunity to present the gospel to people. To populate heaven so that God can be worshipped. So not only... Do we need to know the gospel? Not only do we need to understand the mandate, but we need to understand the history. How did we all get here this morning? So I read to you now in Acts 1 verse 8 that we're going to be witnesses in both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Do you know that the gospel doesn't come from America, by the way? doesn't come from Bethel or the Baptist church. The gospel comes from the Middle East, okay? And you realize that we are the ends of the earth. Isn't that amazing? We are actually the ends of the earth. And it got here by the blood and the sweat and the tears of those who brought it to us. It came here because of, of people who gave up their lives. Who sacrificed everything to bring it to us. 
I think of the missionary C.T. Studd. C.T. Studd chose to be a missionary in China, in America, in India, in Africa, and he chose it over being a professional cricket player. And he came out of a very wealthy family. And he gave up the wealth, he gave up the money to proclaim the gospel. And he died in a little village in Africa at the age of 70. I read a quote from C.T. Studd. He says, My only joys therefore are that when God has given me work to do, I have not refused it. Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that beautiful? Or what about Henry Martin? He's born in England. He leaves for India at the age of 24. At the age of 24, he leaves to the mission field. He gets to India and he translates the whole of the New Testament into Urdu. And then the Persian language. Do you know what's crazy? He wrote a girl back home and asked her to, to marry him. It took the letter six months to get to her. And it took six months for her answer to come back. And she said, no. That sucks, eh? It's a little bit of humor in there. But at the age of 24, Henry Martin puts his feet down in India. And he starts translating. And he starts giving the Bible to people in the Urdu language and the Persian language. And then while he's crossing the deserts of Turkey... He dies. And he was 30 years old. Six years. Six years he gave it all. Six years he poured out his life. He poured out his life in obedience and because of conviction and because of love for a people group. A quote from Henry Martin. When he put his feet down in India, he said, now let me burn out for God. End of quote. Now let me burn out for God. Or oh, my favorite, David Livingston. David Livingston comes to Africa. He's mauled by buffalo. He's mauled by a lion on his first trip here. That His one arm he can't raise higher than his shoulder. He has malaria over 27 recorded times that we know of. He loses his wife in Africa. He loses one of his children. Sacrifice upon sacrifice upon sacrifice to make a way for the gospel on this continent. A quote from David Livingston, and you better hold on to your Bibles for this one. Sympathy. Sympathy is no substitute for action. In other words, af fui toch, beteken niks. It means nothing. Sympathy is no substitute for action. Now what on earth made them do it? What made them do it? What made them sacrifice? What made them give up everything to bring us the gospel? I'll tell you what made them do it. Their love for God and their love for people. I'll tell you what made them do it. A clear understanding of the gospel that redeemed them and that saved them. That's what made them do it. You know what else made them do it? Every page in this book cries out that God is redeeming lost people unto himself and that us, the church, are the means that he's going to do it by. He's going to use us to bring people unto him. If you look at the Abrahamic call in Genesis, Abraham, go, leave your country, leave your kindred, leave your people. That's missions. That was God making his name great and known amongst all the other nations. By taking Abraham and saying to him, from you will come a people, the Jewish people, the Israelite people, and they will be my witnesses. They will represent me to all the nations that were scattered from the Tower of Babel, 
who do not serve me. That's what happened there. That's missions in the Abrahamic call. Or what about David? Who would have thought? You all know this, the, the story of David and Goliath. Is that a missional story? In 1 Samuel 17 verse 46, on this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands. This is David speaking to Goliath. To Goliath. He says, I'm going to cut off your head and I'm going to feed the bodies of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the beasts on the land so that the whole world will know that Israel has a God. That's missions. That's missions right there. Or in the psalm, Psalm 46.10, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted amongst the nations of the earth. That's missions in the psalms. Or the prophets. We sang it this morning. Isaiah. Yar I am, Lord, send me. Or Hosea 2 verse 23. And I will say unto them who are not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. Or Malachi 1 verse 11, God's name will be exalted amongst all the nations, its missions. Or what about the apostles? God says to Ananias concerning the apostle Paul, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. It's all about missions throughout the whole book, man. The legacy and the history demands our commitment. Are you really going to let that die out with you? Are we going to let that flame and that legacy die out on your watch? God forbid. God forbid. I know where I come from. I know what he saved me from. I am ever grateful for the gospel. I take the mandate seriously. I am grateful for those who brought me the gospel knowing that there are so many people out there who have never, ever heard of the first coming of Christ. We stand in our churches and we sing about the second coming of Christ. And we speak very nonchalantly about the second coming of Christ. When there are millions upon millions of people who've never heard of his first coming. So, to sum it up. There's over 7,000 people groups, tribes, on this planet that are still unreached. In other words, they've never heard of his first coming. Just in India, there are 2,500 unreached people groups. And when I speak of a people group, a tribe, you're talking about millions of people within that tribe. There are 2,500 tribes just in India. Over 450 in Pakistan. Over 400 in China. There are 3 billion people who have nobody around them to tell them the good news, let alone to disciple them. What has missions... And evangelism got to do with you and me? Everything. Everything. You know that depravity, lostness, separation from God, depravity, it is the eternal, uttermost, worst condition that a person can be found in. And the Christian is the one that has the remedy. We have the answer. If you had the cure for cancer, would you sit there and be quiet with it? I lost my daddy to cancer. If I had the cure to cancer, do you think I'd keep it to myself? Would you? Depravity is far worse, man. And we, we have the cure. We have the answer. Your boat, your car, your house, your sofa, your business, your job, your farm, all your degrees, every single one of that stuff will disappear. It will disappear. James 4 verse 14 says, What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little while and then 
vanishes. There's more to life than what a lot of us are living for today. There's a mandate and there's a calling that God has given us as Christians that is glorious, that is beautiful, that is exciting, and that will give you true fulfillment in life. My prayer is, is that you will take all that you are, that you will take your life, that you will take your marriage, that you will take your family, and that you will bring it all under submission to God and His Word. Give up waiting. So many people say, in dag wanneer my skip inkom. One day when my ship comes in, I'll do something. One day, I'm going to go work for the Lord. Folks, none of us are even guaranteed of the day of tomorrow. Not one of us. Live your life for the purposes of God. And you will experience the most fulfilled life that you can experience. Can I pray for you? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we could gather this morning and be challenged by your word. Father, thank you so much for the salvation that came to my uncle in this church and the seed that he planted in my life. Though I went through many more years of rebellion, I thank you for that seed. Father, I thank you for the radical change and transformation that you brought about in my life. Father, I don't know many of the people sitting here this morning. But Father, there might be people who feel lost, who feel alone, who feel that they don't have purpose. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will lay upon their hearts that they can be part of something beautiful, something glorious, and something wonderful. And Father, as we just take a time now just to pray, I pray that people will pour out their commitments to you. That families will pour out their commitments to you. A commitment towards the gospel. A commitment to not being ashamed or shy of being a Christian. A commitment to be vocal about their faith. Father, we think of Edwin. Please keep them safe as they travel as they share the gospel further from here. Father, and I pray your blessing upon this church, that you will continue to use them to be a beacon of light. And I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.